Hello, my name is Daniel Adibi, and I will be your host for Our World 101, the show in which we talk about complicated, real-world events and issues to bridge people together. Today's topic is one of the most pressing issues of our time, climate change. This is something that every person in my generation should be worried about. Large corporations are releasing greenhouse gases and polluting the earth. And if we don't do something about it, our world will be changed forever. Here to talk to us today about climate change is Rob Altenberg, the Senior Director for Energy and Climate at Penn Future. Penn Future is an organization with the goal of making Pennsylvania a clean energy economy. So Mr. Altenberg, welcome to the show. We are really excited to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here, Daniel. Can you tell us a little about yourself and the work you've done? Oh, sure. Well, Penn Future, we're a statewide environmental nonprofit. We, so we have offices all over Pennsylvania. We focus on a number of our environmental <laughs> issues. My background is primarily in the area of energy, climate, and uh, air pollution. And before I came to Penn Future, I spent 22 years with the Department of Environmental Protection in the Air Program and the Policy Office, uh, working on things like forecasting, uh, forecasting air quality, uh, bad air quality days, and things like that, and then working on individual policies to remediate air quality issues. Yeah, that's really interesting. How did you become interested in climate change? Um, well, really, is when I graduated from college in the in the late '80s. This was really the up and coming issue. Um, you know, starting in, starting in the air program. Then at that time, most of our focus was on things like acid rain, ozone smog, and pollution like that. But it was the same facilities that were creating the ozone smog and acid rain and pollution that were really the uh, major cause of uh, the climate problem. So we. You know, as as we started addressing the one issue, the other issue became uh, much more prominent. Yeah, and so right now you're currently working at Penn Future, and the goals of Penn Future are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or dirty energy, and to improve water and air quality. Mm -hmm. Can you describe how Penn Future is currently fighting for these goals, and how these issues are affecting people today? Well, sure. Uh, to uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we have to look at where the emissions are coming from. And it's roughly, you can roughly think about it in thirds. So about a third of the problem is the energy industry, electricity generation. About a third of the problem is industrial. And about a third of the problem is transportation. There's, there's a little bit more in other sources in there, small amount residential, small amount commercial. But those are the big three categories. So in energy generation, we're looking at things like Pennsylvania participating in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, putting a cap on carbon. Uh, for transportation, uh, there's a new program coming out where Pennsylvania is going to participate with the uh, California Zero Emission Vehicle Program, um, and that should lower our emissions a little bit. It's a first step, but it's, a, it's an important step in that direction. Industrial is a hard one. Um, but things like energy efficiency and cleaning uh, energy generation and uh, limiting the uh, growth of the petrochemical industry really uh, can take a big chunk out of those industrial emissions. And what are some recent victories that Penn Future has had? Um, well, what we have we have managed to. Uh, uh, well, one, move, there, we, I may just mentioned the Reggie program, uh, Pennsylvania participating in Reggie. We just recently got through the uh, in, the uh, Independent Regulatory Review Commission with that rule. So that rule is moving forward, and we hope to have that implemented pretty soon. Uh, in, in the past, we've done things like there were programs on the way that would have made it more challenging for individuals to put solar on their roof. Uh, and get reimbursed for the solar energy that they generate. Uh, we've managed to hold the line on the existing programs that we have. Um, and there's been, a, there's been a number of other, or I would say probably less prominent benefits uh, that we've worked on, things like making sure our building codes encourage more efficient generation um, and uh, challenging things like permits that are not, um, that don't meet environmental standards and other things like that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, has there been any specific 
legislation that you've been fighting for? Have you had any laws implemented? Um, and how has that legislation affected Pennsylvania? Well, there's, there's a number of packages that we're working on right now. Um, it's not over the finish line yet. Um, one of the main ones is uh, a community solar program for Pennsylvania. Uh, right now, probably 50 to 75% of Pennsylvanians uh, don't have solar access. They either live in multifamily homes, they rent, they live in a shaded area, so they can't really put solar on their roof. And what community solar would let them do is if they can't put solar on the roof themselves, they can buy or lease a share of a more centralized solar uh, solar installation and get this and get pretty much the same benefits. So we're working on that. We hope to get that. We hope to get that bill across the line. Um, you know, historically we've done we've worked on a number of important uh, pieces of legislation in Pennsylvania. One of the big ones was our Alternative Energy Portfolio Standards Act that requires a certain amount of energy be come from clean renewable sources. Um, now that was several years ago, we got that piece of legislation passed and now we're looking at what's the next step in that program and we'd like to see that move along too. Yeah, and speaking of renewable energy, um, what do you think is the most promising alternative energy source right now? Um, well, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, potential sources out there. Pennsylvania, in particular, ha is really the solar industry in Pennsylvania, in particular, is is growing. We have an incredible potential for solar generation in the state, and solar power itself is getting cheaper and cheaper. In many markets now, we're seeing that building new solar installations is cheaper than running existing fossil fuel uh, installations. So the market is the market is starting to shift. Um, so we'll, we should see um, significant growth in solar over the next few years. We have potential for more wind generation. We have a good bit already, but we could see a lot more of that. Um, then there's things like energy storage uh, that uh, really the up and coming sector of the industry uh, that we have a lot of potential for. And what that lets us do is address issues with solar, wind, and other variable sources of energy. Uh, so it stabilizes the amount of generation you get and makes our grid more flexible. Now, there's you know other things out there that are um, you know out there as well, but those are probably the big technologies that we're looking at. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to read an excerpt from the Pennsylvania Constitution. The people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all people, including generations yet to come. I was just wondering how you felt that certain companies were violating um, the excerpt, excerpt that I just read. From well, the Pennsylvania well that, Constitution. Yeah, see, that's an important part of the Constitution. Um, that's Article 1, Section 27 of our Pennsylvania Constitution. And that's really, that's the same, that's in Article 1 in our state constitution is like our Bill of Rights in the state. So things like um, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, that's all in Article 1. And this is our environmental rights amendment. And it's really elevated in the same caliber as all of those other really fundamental freedoms. And what this says, and it's not really talking to uh, businesses or companies, it's talking to the state government. When it says the Commonwealth, it's talking to the state government. And what it says is they have a trust responsibility to preserve um, those environmental rights for not just us today, uh, but future generations. And that's one of the key things I think we're seeing uh, has not historically happened. You know, when we have things like uh, rapid petrochemical development, what the what our legislators will often say is, we want jobs, so let's subsidize a polluting industry and they'll bring jobs. Um, they're ignoring this very fundamental requirement in the constitution that says they have to preserve those resources. Well, it's conserve and maintain is the language. And that doesn't mean we can't have economic development and we can't have you know, some industries that do cause pollution and things like that, but they really have a high bar to, um, to meet those standards. Now we are starting to see our courts pay attention to this. 
Uh, recently, what we've seen is uh, is holdings by the court that's saying if the state leases out mineral resources like gas resources for gas wells, like we saw in in, uh, in our state parks and forests, the money that comes in can't just be spent on anything. We can't just send it to the general fund and use it for whatever we want. It really has to go back to preserving those environmental rights, to preserving those resources. Um, so yeah, the real focus of that, and very, very important to, that we have this environmental rights uh, legislation, but the real focus is this responsibility of our legislators and our government. And can you tell us what Pennsylvania and the world will look like if we are unable to put an end to climate change and pollution? Well, we do have, a, I mean, a certain amount of the damage right now from climate change is baked in. Um, we're, you know, you know, we're already seeing the damage. Um, just a few weeks ago, we had uh, the run, remnants of Hurricane Ida coming through. And what we're seeing more and more in the recent reports out of the Intergovernmental Cli Panel on Climate Change say it directly connects the dots between warming climate, warming oceans, more severe storms. So part of Ida, the flooding, the tornado damage, and that that we saw directly in Pennsylvania was directly attributable to this war to the warming climate. So we're going to see that damage. Um, what we're trying to do is avoid the worst and most catastrophic forms of damage. The Department of Environmental Protection recently uh, worked with Penn State and others on a impacts assessment. And what they're saying is by 2050, Pennsylvania could have the climate of like Richmond, Virginia. Um, so really market changes. And a lot of what we take for granted in Pennsylvania really depends on our climate. Um, our agriculture is our biggest industry. Dairy is the biggest sector of that. Dairy cows are very sensitive to heat. Their production drops when the heat goes up. So, you know, there's a significant effect on just that industry alone. Uh, we have a tourism industry that's very sensitive to climate, even things like our fisheries for our trout fisheries. It's a cold water species. Um, they don't do well in much warmer temperatures. Um, so we're going to see direct economic effects like that. We're going to see more storm damage, more flooding, um, you know, areas of drought, areas of intense rainfall, more extremes in that regard, um, more disease vectors. Um, you know, we've seen West Nile virus and other insect, Lyme disease and other insect-borne diseases. All of that is likely to increase, uh, likely to increase as temperatures warm and we have climate change. The question really is what the magnitude of these changes are going to be. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says we really need to keep our warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade to avoid the worst effects. Um, if we don't act responsibly and soon, keeping it below two or three degrees centigrade is going to be very difficult. So the better we can do, the more of these negative effects we're going to avoid. Yeah, and obviously we need to stop climate change. What needs to happen in order to make sure that we don't increase our temperature by more than two or three degrees and eventually put an end to climate change? What do we need to do? Yeah. Well, the um, you know, what the IPCC says we, says we need, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is to get to net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and net zero doesn't mean zero. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't mean we won't have any polluting sources. You know, there will still likely be some, you know, cars and planes and things like that. But what it means is every ton of emissions that we put in the air, we have to offset with some other form, some sink to take them out of the air. So a balance we're not adding to, adding to the problem. Uh, this is a very challenging target to hit. But if we look at where those emissions are, again, it's that rule of thirds, about a third electric generation, a third transportation, and a third industrial. And we have to work in all of those areas together to get these emissions down. And before we you know, really allow any more pollution in any of these sectors, we have to ask ourselves, well, okay, if they're going to pollute, if we 
you know, we need this amount of pollution for some business, some industry. Uh, what are we going to do to offset it? So what are we, you know, we've got to do more in some other area to make up for it. So we've got to start thinking like that. Yeah. And um, many people understand that climate change is an issue and we need to stop it, but we're not really sure how to help. What can we do as individuals to help end climate change? Well, about 65% of the problem is um, the, is the fossil fuel industry alone. Um, so when we talk about you know individual action, it's great you know, that we can put solar panels on a roof and do things like that. But residential is less than 10% of the problem. Um, you know, things, you know, we talk about things like eating less meat, using less energy, doing things like that. This is less than 10% of the problem. It's a 10% that we're going to have to address at some point. But if we are going to, uh, if we're going to address the problem, we need to focus on where the pollution is happening. And that is largely happening uh, with the fossil fuel industry, you know, in energy generation, transportation, and then the industrial uses. So that probably the biggest thing that people can do is talk to their legislators <laughs> and say, you know, we need to address this and we need state and federal legislation working on addressing these emissions from these largest industries. I mean, that is going to be the biggest bang for the buck. I mean, the other things we're going to need to do, <laughs> we're going to have to get there eventually. We uh, like to talk about an 80-20 rule. The 80% of it is the easy stuff. The 20% of it is the hard stuff. Um, you know, we've got a whole lot of emissions we can address. Um, that's the first target. Um, once we get done that, we can address, you know, the individual things, you know, do we, you know, do we uh, make our homes more efficient? We Everybody put on solar panels, things like that. But that's a smaller part of the issue. Yeah. And obviously passing legislation is very important in order to stop climate change, because as you said, it's mostly the large corporations causing mm -hmm. the problem. And it's an international problem. So it's, I mean, we need to, we, there's room for state and federal legislation, but we do have to cooperate internationally if we are going to address the problem. What is your response to people who claim that climate change is a hoax? Hey, you know, we've, we just see the evidence. Um, um, you know, we were saying for years that 95% of climate scientists or more you know, accept that human caused global warming, it, it, you know, humans are causing global warming. Um, they just came out with a new study this this past week, I believe, that's, that's up to 99.9%. There really isn't any significant scientific debate on the issue anymore. Um, we see the evidence, it's plain as day, our models are, have been accurate for years, and they are getting more and more accurate. In fact, um, when our models have been wrong, our models have tended to underpredict the problem. Our models have tended on the conservative side, saying, you know, saying, you know, we're predicting eh, it's going to be, you know, this level of warming or this level of damage. And when we've actually seen the results, it's been worse than the models predicted. Um, um, not, not too surprising that it did that, but just the evidence is there. The uh, the people that are you know climate deniers at this point saying you know it's not this problem, it's some other problem are just you know often they are paid by you know, fossil fuel industries or other interests just to intentionally confuse people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean obviously the problem is here. We see the evidence, um, and we need to stop it. Are there any recent innovations or companies that make you feel hopeful? Um, you know, what we're, we're seeing, um, I mean, certainly there's, um, there's new innovations and new technologies that we're hearing about all the time um, um, that, you know, could potentially help in the future. Uh, what we're trying to focus on really though is, you know, what do we have on the ground today? Um, you know, what, what can we feel today? Um, um, and in that area, the solar industry has really been, has really been one of the leaders. Their prices have come down uh, remarkably in the past few years. Um, it's now, it's, much, it's cheaper than it ever was to install solar. The energy efficiency industry has been another uh, real standout. 
And this is a wide range of things, you know, from better windows to better insulation, uh, better lighting is a big one going to LED lighting. You know, we've seen through energy efficiency, companies can um, expand, you know, can grow, you know, create jobs, have economic growth, and not increase the amount of the money of spending there on, elect on electricity and energy. Their energy demand is going down as the production is going up. And that's really the, what we need to see. Um, a lot of people, when you talk about um, energy efficiency or conservation, they jump to this idea where, well, that means we should not have heat in our houses or turn our heat way down or not have nice things or, <laughs> or, um, or not have jobs or economic growth. But that's not really the way it is. You know, what we're seeing now is we can, you know, increase our economic activity and growth at the same time that we are lowering our emissions. And, you know, energy efficiency in general has been a big uh, contributor to that. Uh, before we close our discussion, is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, well, I'd like to say thank you for having me on and talk about energy and climate. I'm always happy to do that. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think the big closing thing for, you know, what what people I think need to do and, you know, all people, especially the young, younger generation, we, we saw we saw this in um, in um, really in Europe with, you know, climate strikes and groups like Fridays for Future and things like that, where a lot of the younger people have really taken the um, initiative to step up and address climate change. Because really, it is going to be a problem that is going to be increasingly faced by that younger generation. And I think, you know, getting out there and talking to legislators and talking to the public and saying, you know, ignoring the problem is not acceptable. You know, just like our state constitution says, there's a responsibility to address these pollution issues, not just for today, but for generations yet to come. And that's been forgotten for a long time. And I think it's really important that we see, you know, especially more, more of the younger people step up and say, you know, this is the problem that you, that you are leaving for me, <laughs> you are leaving for my friends, and we need to solve that and, you know, go, go, get going in the right direction right now. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think those are really powerful words. Thank you. We've had a great discussion. We talked about your work, a little bit about Penn Future, the issues that climate change presents and what needs to happen to stop it. Mr. Altenberg, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was really great talking to you. Sure, it's great talking to you, Daniel. Thanks. To all of our viewers, I hope you'll join us for our next episode. I'm Daniel Adibi, and I'll see you soon.